Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm Anthony Daparan, and uh, here this morning we are going to be hearing uh, Jia Yang Fun's story of her family and international propaganda. Um, but before we start, just a reminder of our next upcoming event uh, that's going to be on uh, this Thursday at eight o'clock in the evening, Hong Kong time, the future of the COVID-19 pandemic, what happens next? Uh, and the speakers on Thursday will be uh, Dr. Sarah Borwine from the Central Health Group and Professor Ivan Hung and Professor John Nichols, both at the, the University of Hong Kong. So uh, do um, register for, for that. Um, but today uh, we have uh, Jia Yang Fan. Um, Jia Yang Fan is a staff writer at, for the New Yorker magazine, uh, where she writes about China and Chinese American politics and culture. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Book Review, the New York Times Magazine, uh, and the Paris Review, among other places. Uh, Jia Yang was born in Chongqing and moved to the US when she was eight years old. She graduated from Williams College and received a Fulbright scholarship to spend a year in Korea. Uh, and today she'll be talking about, among other things, her cover story for The New Yorker recently, How My Mother and I Became Chinese Propaganda. If you have any questions for Jia Yang during the course of uh, this morning's session, uh, you can email them to question at fcchk.org. That's question singular at fcchk.org. And now I'll turn it over to our president, uh, Jody Schneider from Bloomberg, who will be uh, moderating the discussion with Jaya. Thank you. Thank you, An thank you, Anthony. Um, much appreciate the introduction and uh, good morning. Uh, well, morning here, Jiayang. It's uh, <laughs> evening in New York where you are. So yeah. thank you. We're we're thrilled to have you with us uh, in our uh, FTC yeah. Zoom room. <laughs> um, <laughs> but and before we get into the story about and behind your cover piece, which uh, is one of the things we want to talk about today, um, we please tell us what it's like to work for the New Yorker. Uh, many of us could, would consider it a dream job in journalism, the, the pinnacle uh, of journalism. And tell us what it was like, how you came to be there. Um, you know, was this a, a dream for you too, that, you know, you wanted to work for the New Yorkers as something that you looked at or, or were you, how did it happen and what is it like? Right. So I, um, I did start reading the New Yorker as a teenager and always knew of a illustrious reputation. I didn't, having said that, I didn't think that there was necessarily a pathway for me to end up at the place, at a place like the New Yorker. And, uh, um, and it was really a bit of serendipity that got me there. Um, and to this day, I feel very grateful um, uh, that I ran into a former classmate at, um, from Williams College whose girlfriend was the fact checker at the New Yorker. And this was when Evan Osmo started writing for the magazine. There was a lot of need for a Chinese translator. And I was taken on part-time as just this freelance translator. And it was really my um, Chinese language skills that got me the job but more than anything else. And it just shows you, I mean, I was a philosophy and English double major in college. I really didn't think that uh, my Chinese language, which just happened to be the language that I speak with my mother, um, that I, uh, you know, um, used to watch uh, Chinese drama series. It didn't, it didn't, and also, you know, it, it seemed like a private, um, it, 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 it did seem to me like something that was, you know, uh, uh, like private to, um, my, you know, family dynamic to, 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 to like, Considering where I was coming, the, the schools that I had attended, which were predominantly very white, um, I didn't think that Chinese would ever be in you. Um, my, Chi my Chinese language abilities would ever be used in a public sphere. So um, I didn't feel like I was extremely um, caught off guard when that became my calling card for a job. And I was a back checker at the New Yorker for. Um, seven years um, at that time, um, the, the web presence in, um, at the New Yorker was ramping up. So I started um, pitching, I started pitching um, uh, smaller 
web posts, like blog posts almost. And that's how um, I really got my uh, foot in the door as it were to writing. Um, and I, I mean, to this day, I still think of it as a dream job. I um, feel incredibly fortunate to be able to have this job, but um, I would be remiss if I did owe it at least in part to luck and to, um, to serendipity. <laughs> Well, we, I'm sure we have some students watching or, and will be listening later to the uh, YouTube version. And um, that, that's good uh, for them to know, like, you know, brush up on your, your Chinese language. Skills. <laughs> <laughs> so it come, comes in handy. Uh, tell us what, what it's like there. Is there a, you know, a pitch process? How does it work? Like with this story that we're going to talk about uh, that became a cover story, how did this come about? Did you... Um, you know, was it something that you had initially written something uh, shorter on and they said, give us more? Or did you, um, how did this, how does it happen there? Right. How do, you, how do you get a cover story? Right. So I, um, again, I mean, I think uh, these opportunities, um, they feel, I mean, they, they feel so impossible um, before they, you know, before before they come your way. And I, I didn't really ever expect to be able to write for the magazine when I started at the New Yorker. I mean, I remember at my, um, at my uh, interview, I was told uh, that there would be no upward mobility. Um, uh, this was at my fact checking interview. And I really took that to heart. And I thought that, you know, at least I would get, I would learn about the magazine um, through being a fact checker. And that would be, um, that would be just very, I think, edifying for me. Um, I remember, you know, I think it was five or six years into, into checking, there was a story that came in about um, mortgage fraud that was happening at a Chinese bank. And uh, the writer who um, uh, knew a little bit about the story was too close to some of the sources, so he couldn't do it. And, uh, um, and I was asked, well, no, actually, you know, he very generously, um, and I do uh, want to point out that we, as writers, we owe so much to the generosity of our colleagues. And he was the one who said, hey, you know, I have this story, I can't report on it. I don't know if this is a blog post or, um, you know, like a, like a shorter story, a talk story, um, or a magazine piece, but it's worth considering. And I remember the trepidation I felt, um, never having uh, even considered writing a magazine piece and not really sure whether I was up to the task um, and then pitching it being utterly um, uh, unprepared for uh, my boss to say, well, okay, go for it. And uh, I, it was written on spec, which just means that um, you, know, it's, you don't have an, assi an official assignment form. It's really based on the quality of what you turn in that the story then is finally scheduled. But I remember as like a 29 year old, I was incredibly grateful to be writing um, uh, on spec um, uh, on, on, on anything. And, uh, and that was how that first, um, and that first story I think took about nine months to report. I was going to court every day, um, uh, sneaking in, um, uh, sneaking in court during my lunch hour at my full, at my full time fact checking job. And, um, and just really hoping that uh, I could turn it into a story and not knowing at the time whether whether that was um, a real possibility. Well, the fact checkers at the New Yorker must love you. Um, your things, I'm sure, come in in um, pretty good shape. <laughs> oh, no, Although I, think I for, for any back, for any of the New Yorker fact checkers, I mean, listening out there, no, I mean, I think, um, I think I, I, I am so, <coughs> excuse me, endlessly grateful to um, the New Yorker fact checkers and to fact checkers in general. I mean, in every medium that I've worked in, whether it's a podcast or magazine uh, writing, or even to short, you know, um, uh, video clips. I mean, fact checking, I think is, you know, it, it, that's at the foundation of integrity for, you know, journalism um, and absolutely, um, uh, you know, they do heroic work and it's often thankless work because they are, you know, their name is not on the byline. Um, but uh, they're they're so vital, I think, to um, journalism, to the integrity of journalism as an industry, and to um, us journalists in particular. They um, 
uh, it's also, but it's also, I think, uh, probably um, uh, important for me to say that as a writer, like, even though I worked as a journalist for, I mean, as a, as a fact checker for a number of years, when you're writing, I mean, you're really, when you're composing the story, it, at least for me, it feels like it needs to come organically. And if you were just every moment sort of um, uh, checking, you know, every line in your notebook, that can, that can, that can, slow not only slow down but really um uh kind of stultify the writing process so what you really need to do I, I think is absorb everything from your notebooks write it and then go back and do your own fact checking before you um hand it off to the fact checkers if you don't want to be known as too much of a nightmare because uh when you're when you're writing um after having you know absorbed everything in your notebook we all know that human memory is far, far from perfect and um, many of the errors uh that um that's you know discovered during the fact checking process is not from kind of an intentional um uh, uh malicious kind of attempt to uh to screw with the facts but just because you like misremembered how many floors a building um, a building was made up of and what color um, blouse you know someone was wearing but um, nevertheless nevertheless I think those corrections are absolutely vital well thank you for giving us that window into the New Yorker we can we the rest of us can dream um, but I wanted to talk now about your piece uh, how my mother and I became Chinese propaganda which was a cover story in the September 14th issue of the magazine um, it focuses for those who haven't read it and those who haven't should read it. Um, it focuses on how publicizing your mother's plight as an ALS patient at the Henry J. Carter Specialty Hospital in New York, a long-term acute care facility uh, during the coronavirus led to a nasty propaganda campaign uh, on social media and in the media in China against you and your mother, in which you ended up being portrayed as traitors to China. Uh, first of all, I found the piece um, very moving and Thank also you. quite a, quite evocative of the time of the virus. Also, um, I understand it's you have a, a, a book deal on this and it oh. feels like uh, it felt like we would want to I would want to read more. So I'm very excited for you about, Thank you. about the book deal. Um, but in, in terms of um, the, the piece itself, um, you know, a lot of this was about your desire as a daughter to protect your mother during the virus, but also about how you two immigrated to America, her dreams deferred on, on your behalf, and, and anti-Asian uh, sentiment in the, in the U.S. Uh, right. It looks like, it, tell us how you decided to write this and, and in this form uh, label this personal history. And was that difficult to write because it was so personal or, or was it cathartic in some ways? I think it was a little bit of both, to be honest. Um, I didn't, I actually did not intend to write the piece as um, a personal history. It really started after I was just so unexpectedly um, inundated with um, attacks on uh, social media. It started with um, just uh, um, an idea to maybe examine the role of nationalist trolls um, on media. Um, and their increasingly international presence. Um, I, I had, uh, I had interviewed a number of um, Chinese experts, Chinese um, media experts on the subject. But the more I thought about how I would frame the piece, um, the more I wanted to make sure that I gave them a humanity that they, that they don't necessarily grant to um, their targets, which is to say that, um, you know, they're often dismissed and many of them are sort of these, uh, you know, robots um, or kind of part of this, you know, farm of, um, of you know, what's been called, um, you know, 50 cent party uh, members and, 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 and not all of them are and many of them have, um, have said, you know, I am just a patriotic young um, Chinese person and I want to call out um, everyone um, who has been disloyal to uh, you know the motherland and uh, in a lot of their as I was reading through their comments to me on uh, Twitter which is my main um, social media platform I was struck by um, I was struck just by the absolute specificity of their um, 
<laughs> of their of their uh, insults. I mean, the you know some of them said, "I want to eat your mother's ashes," or "I want to mutilate your corpse" in this very specific way. That was difficult for me to read, but also made me realize there is so much rage and fury at the other side um, of this computer and that's not coming from an automaton that's coming from someone with flesh and blood and who truly feels that my crime against china is unforgivable and i want to investigate that in a way that felt as three-dimensional as possible and that without um condone condoning their actions at least comes from a place of understanding and uh, um, and journalistic compassion, if that makes any sense. That is not to say that I welcome um, attempts um, of strangers uh, to mutilate my corpse. It's the idea. I mean, for me, it's that you know, as a writer, you are you have more responsibility to probe into the impulses of what people do, even if they seem counterintuitive, even um, even if they do not um, accord with your own sense of the world or of um, your you know, obligations to that world. But I just, I, I was very, very um, curious about why, you know, if these are not people who are paid to, um, to, to attack me, what, how these feelings accrued and what, um, and I guess, uh, you know, what, what injustices they felt they had suffered to merit such, um, uh, you know, vicious attacks on someone that, that they, you know, that, that they, they've only read about on the internet. And that's sort of how the, the story um, arose in the first place. And when I started writing, I realized that if I had to understand their psychology, then I better, um, be as honest on the page about my situation with my mother as possible. And that, you know, recalled memories of my mother feeling sometimes, you know, betrayed by her Americanized daughter and wondering if she had made the right decision in, um, in, in uh, staying in this country as um, an immigrant. So, so, so the story um, definitely didn't, it didn't fall into place in one fell swoop. And, um, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I'm careful about the word cathartic because I, of course, want the reader to feel that they've arrived at a different place um, at the end of the story than, the, than where they've started. But for me, for the writer, I think um, I'm to be able to deal with my own stuff, you know, in the therapist's office. Um, on the page, you know, there needs to be restraint and there needs to be a real consideration of how um, how the experience, how the reading experiences, and whether that um, that 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 journey of reading the piece is fulfilling for um, for the reader. And that's why I went through multiple drafts. I think maybe the first draft was cathartic, but by the by the by the eighth draft, it was just trying to make sure that um, I didn't waste your time. You know, um, someone who's decided to spend forty minutes reading my piece. Why do you think this provokes such a large reaction on social media? I, I went back and read some of the tweets that, that you had done at the time, and you were, you know, you were a daughter who was trying to get to use whatever uh, means you could to help your mother. It was, it was a lot of it was to help her get, allow her aid to stay with her during the coronavirus and right. not be kicked out of the hospital, which I take that she was for a short time and then was allowed back at the, right. the campaign succeeded. But why do you think this became, it didn't seem traitorous when you read it. Uh, <laughs> why, why did this, it really did seem like you're trying to do what you could for your mother, right? It, it happened, you were in America, but why do you think this provoked the, the huge uh, outrage that, that it did uh, in, in Chinese social media and, and somewhat in Chinese media? State -owned, I think state media. Right. I think I've 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 been thinking about that question for for um for some time, and it's 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 really the central question I think um at the um at the heart of you know what what has happened. I think that um I think that I am I became this very convenient vehicle for all these feelings burbling under the surface between, you know, in the relationship between US and China. And 
some of those feelings I think are, um, some of those, I mean, is a product of um, this particularly tense moment in our geopolitical relationship between China and um, the US. And at a moment when um, disinformation and misinformation is such a, such a perennial part of the landscape and how we even understand, you know, how, of, of, of our media diet. Um, and, um, but another part of it, I think is just about how primal the, the parent-child relationship is. I think to everyone in the world, but particularly to, um, to the Chinese and to the way that they understand, they conceive of their relationship to um, uh, the Communist Party and to, you know, the head of, to the, to the, to the political head of the country. And that has to do, I think, a lot with um, how the party projects itself. I mean, I am a child of um, 80s China. I'm a child of the party. I mean, my, my mother was a party member. And, uh, um, and that loyalty, I mean, the sense of, um, you know, filial piety that is expected from a child is part of how, um, you know, a young person sees their identity in the world. Now, then you have um, the story of my mother and I, you know, of a parent and a child, which I think um, immediately resonates with, um, uh, you know, Chinese um, Chinese people. Uh, and then I think uh, the and 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 you combine that with the fact that this Chinese person, um, this Chinese uh, woman who looks hysterical, you know, in her pictures is someone that the you know, state affiliated media and um, you know, kind of major power players in Chinese media have decided has um, betrayed her country um, by blackening its reputation by slandering what progress China has made. And I think for, um, for the for Chinese readers at home, there's this very kind of delicious sense of um, vengeance visiting upon um, this woman who already looks like she, you know, has come, you know, is 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 falling apart um, uh, in 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 pictures and. Um, and you know, China, you know, and the Chinese is very into the idea of karma, into fate, into a yuan, um, and uh, the idea that of course I deserve to lose my mother in the pandemic for my um, traitorous actions, uh, my villainy against um, against against um, against China. I think it, you know, it came packaged in this narrative that you know with with some shaping by um by by um chinese uh uh media became a perfect parable for the kind of political story that the chinese or that the that the government was trying i mean that the government but also i think you know the culture at the time was trying to push, um, and uh, it, uh, it it just kind of hit all the it kind of hit all the um, the nerve centers, and then it um, immediately became viral in absolutely the worst sense of the word. Yeah, yeah, at a, at a time of a virus, um, right? Um, you are obviously very active in social media, and and on uh, Twitter, I dare say you're a bit of a, a journalistic celebrity. Um, at the heart of the New Yorker cover story is how social media can distort facts and create narratives that are far from accurate and incite hate, and as you're uh, telling us now, threats of violence. Yet at the same time, in the piece you mentioned, your Twitter campaign to bring attention to your mother's aide being kicked out of the hospital, out of her care facility, was one of the reasons that her aide was allowed back in. Uh, you wrote, my impromptu Twitter campaign had borne fruit. Right. Uh, how do you view social media media through your unique prism? Um, do you think it's going in the right or wrong direction? Uh, where, how do you see this? And also, I, I, I enjoy your um, uh, tweets, not on serious subjects, but you're tweeting a lot about food lately in a, in a funny <laughs> way. I'm, I'm enjoying the Taco Bell hot sauce emergency tweets, as I know many people <laughs> probably are. 
<laughs> so tell us, tell us your thoughts about social media and, you know, from, from your own uh, very, you know, unique prism as, as having dealt with uh, both the, the good and also the, the you know, um, sometimes uh, constructive uh, parts of it. Right. Well, I, um, I think I, 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 to this day, I have an ambivalent relationship to, um, to social media, which you wouldn't be able to tell from my um, prolific um, uh, tweeting. And, but, and um, I, I think sometimes um, that Twitter is sort of the worst thing to happen to journalism. <laughs> um, uh, and at other times, I think that it gives me um, a unique conduit to, to um, communicate with uh, my readers and uh, to be a little bit more three-dimensional um, with, my, with my readers. I think that um, Twitter, you know, at its worst, it has this uniquely toxic ability to magnify opposition and to continually egg on escalation. I mean, um, and uh, if Latin's all complexity, um, which is, and I think this last part, because you only have 240 characters and because um, you are, uh, you're so at the same time made to feel very fragile on there because you feel like you have to defend yourself. Every tweet becomes um, this 240 character um, sort of signal of who you are as a person. And when you are attacked, you feel there's that re reflex to immediately um, uh, to either kind of bite back or to, um, you know, defend your honor um, in like a very theatrical way, uh, which is why I think, um, and I, I don't even necessarily recommend this as the best way of using Twitter, but um, as, uh, as, my, as my followers um, will know, I, um, I, uh, I uh, you know, don't, I, I try not to um, take myself too seriously on Twitter. I try to have some fun. I um, break up, you know, my, um, you know, uh, 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 retweeting of articles and self-promotion with a lot of food porn. Um, I am, <laughs> a, I, <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and just sort of, you know, book recommendations, um, on subjects, uh, that I don't report on that are not my, um, beats at all. So that it is a space where, you know, in, you know, in my ideal, it's a space where, um, I feel like I am interacting with this, you know, vibrant community of readers, who um, can teach me as much as, you know, um, as much hopefully as I can um, uh, offer them with, with my reporting. And that kind of ability, I think, to separate your, you know, your, <laughs> um, your real self from this online identity that uh, is at best, you know, like this, I think it's sort of this hammed up shadow of who you are. Um, uh, it's 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 an outlet for me to feel more alone, more, uh, less alone. Um, and, uh, and 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 practically speaking, um, as you can probably tell from my pieces, I uh, you know my, my caretaking for my mom is at you know the center of my life, and and I don't know how. And at first, I, I wasn't sure how professional it was to do, but when I was absolutely desperate, you know, not knowing who to ask for help, I don't have any, you know, other um, family members that I'm in touch with. And I, um, you know, like my mother's sodium has certainly suddenly dropped and there are no, you know, her doctor isn't on call. I mean, do I need to take her to the ER? These questions um, that I, I, I don't have anyone to ask. Twitter um, becomes um, this invaluable community that begins um, to feel like, uh, you know, a family of kind strangers. Um, and I, I really do. I mean, I think that's pretty, that's pro probably pretty unique to me and to my, to my circumstances. And I think, you know, if I had better support, um, I probably wouldn't use it in that way, but I have been tremendously grateful for the kindness of strangers on this website. And, um, and many of them don't even want credit, you know, don't even you know, want me to, to, um, to, 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 to name check them. But, um, but for all the toxicness that we encounter on Twitter, 
I, I do want to give a shout out to the to the unbidden kindness that I encounter there on a daily basis. And um and 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 for that reason, I'm I'm willing to put up with its um <laughs> its its occasional kind of flattening of all complexity. Yeah, well, we've seen that as a club too in uh in standing up for press freedom and uh posting things on Twitter. We get um, an awful lot of uh, people standing with us. So I, I think that there are there are actually benefits. <laughs> um, uh, let's move back to writing. Can you tell us about your writing process? Um, does someone as skilled and experienced as you still get writer's block? Uh, and, and what's your favorite part of the process? Is it, especially when you're reporting, is it reporting or writing or rewriting? Right. Well, um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I think, um, the, <laughs> I think the moment where I feel most, um, excited about the piece, and I think I, I probably wouldn't be writing about this, um, a, a subject, an issue, um, a story at all, if I weren't, you know, excited, um, to begin with, but, uh, I love the moment where I am on, the plane or train back from a reporting trip. And again, I feel such an upswell of amazement that um, all these you know, people have been willing to talk to me and the story sort of is existing in this abstract constellation in my head, you know, themes, um, anecdotes, how do they align, you know, um, how do they um, connect up to make the backbone of a piece? That's tremendously um, exciting and everything exists, you know, in the pure potential and, and, and you know, in, in a way that you know, the great novel that you're composing in your head, oh, you know, always seems perfect um, before, before, before the ink hits the page. Similarly with a piece, um, when I've done all my reporting, when I'm thinking about the structure um, of the piece before I've had to do the hard work of like, you know, um, of, of, of making sure that, uh, you know, the connections actually um, I'll, I'll, I'll check out on the page. I think that's absolutely my favorite part. And sometimes that takes multiple conversations with an editor um, uh, that takes uh, just kind of talking out, you know, the real, the, the architecture of a piece um, uh, with with friends or with, um, you know, usually it's, it's, it's with my editor. That's my, that's my absolutely favorite part. Um, in terms of writer's block, I mean, yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, you're very kind for saying, you know, um, that uh, uh, I am experienced. I, I often, um, at the beginning of every piece, I, I, the question, <laughs> that question that kind of hits me like a tidal wave is, will I be able to, um, will I be able to reach my destination? Will I travel to the end of this piece? Can I actually make this work? Um, and, uh, and I think that is actually, that is, that, that is part of the great fun privilege, but also um, nerve wracking responsibility of being uh, a writer because there's no guarantee, at least to me, never feels like a guarantee that the piece will work, but that's also what's so thrilling about the the, um, the experience. It does feel like an adventure, and my problem um, is that I um, I'm like a I'm like a marathon runner who has not um, adequately put in her training. It's always the last like I would say what like the last fifth of an article where I'm feeling like I'm running out of breath and I'm thinking, oh my god, like I think I have like most of it down, but I have like you know, the ending has to really um, uh, pull together all the different threads. Um, it absolutely has to leave the reader in a different place than when she started. That's when I feel like I'm, my, my, my smoker's cough is like, it's, 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 it's rising in me. And I wonder if I'm gonna be um, able to, um, uh, uh, you know, get there or am I gonna, or am I gonna collapse, you know, um, uh, uh, like 10 feet um, away from the, from the finishing line. So that is definitely um, a moment where I feel like I'm running out of steam. It's not exactly writer's block, but it is, um, I think it's the, the anxiety and fear of letting down um, my readers and letting down myself um, before I've fully delivered the goods. Well, thank you for that. That makes the rest of us feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Going through what we go through when we write. Um, but I just want to remind people that if you have questions, send them to questions 
question singular at fcchk.org and, and um, I will get them and, and ask them. But we do have a question, one from uh, Eric Wishart, who's our first vice president and an editor with AFP. Uh, he also teaches feature writing at Hong Kong University and uses one of your stories as an example of long form writing in his class. Oh, thank you. Asks, yeah, so he asks, can you explain to young journalists how you approach long form pieces for the New Yorker? Uh, with some do's and don'ts on how to construct them would be would be good. Right, um, a great question. Um, and a question that sadly, I, I don't have, um, I think, a perfect answer for. I um, one, one piece of advice I have um, for young writers and which I certainly would have given myself um, if I were to speak to myself 10 years ago is to Keep an, as open a uh, to keep as open a mind as possible in the beginning of the writing process. I find that oftentimes in the anxiety to make sure that you have a piece, um, as a young writer, you feel compelled to make up your mind about where you land on an issue or the moral verdict of a story. And uh, the reporting process um, is one that I've learned to trust more and more and it is one that really educates you about um, the, the full dimensions of the story and where you end up. Um, I think it's okay to communicate um, your sense of, if not exactly um, ambivalence, but I think a very kind of, you know, well-supported sense of um, not knowing where you have to land um, at the end of a story, which is reality itself. You know, rarely um, are stories moral parables where, you know, you can say by the end, well, absolutely, you know, this is, um, uh, this is the moral of the story. And I think it's okay to be, to be, to be, to, 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 um, uh, communicate, you know, your 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 sense of um, uh, of having done your level best to report out the story of really give giving voice to as many different sides of the story as possible, and then still, um, you know, not making just a, a complete, you know, absolutist um, uh, uh, judgment on where the on where the story lands. Um, I think that is that's okay. Um, my second piece of advice is to always do 300 times the amount of reporting you, um, uh, you think you can get away with doing in the beginning. And I say that not out of a masochistic impulse, but because um, you do, you know, your story becomes so much richer and so much better and so much more fulfilling for yourself when you're able to talk to not only sort of like the inner ring of sources, but to, to, to everyone kind of in the progressive outer ring of people who might not be relevant, might be relevant. It, it, it buttresses your sense of, of your, you know, command of the story. And I think that's really, really, um, that's really, that's really important. Certainly for me, um, you know, the, the quotes that go into a story, that's about, I think, like 0.2% of the reporting that I've done. And, um, and in the beginning, you know, when you're a novice writer, you think, my God, like, look at how much I've left on the cutting room floor. Like, you know, all of that was a waste of time. But, you know, you realize um, over the years that um, your sense of, your, your sense of a subject really matures the more people that you talk to. And it's, it's not about who, which quote is included. I mean, that, that, I mean, that certainly you want, you want, you want to harvest the best quotes possible, but um, the way that you write a story changes with kind of the depth of your reporting. So, um, so, so really, um, uh, try to try to try to shy away from like what is the minimum <laughs> possible amount of reporting I can get away with to do this story, but think of it as a more of a long term investment. Um, the more you report, I think you will feel closer to the story, and you will feel more confident writing that story. And um, in um, and I think that the the 
the strength of your voice really comes through, um, uh, you know, the more the more reporting that you're able to do. Great answer. I'm, I'm sure this will help a lot of students. Um, also, in speaking of sourcing, and this also from, from Eric Wishart, uh, what are the guidelines at the New Yorker on the use of anonymous sources and pieces? When is it allowed and when is it not? And what is the process for that there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, um, and I think with anonymous sources um, uh, at the New Yorker, and I, I don't, you know, I've only ever worked at the New Yorker, so I don't know um, if this accords with, you know, official um, uh, uh, guidelines. But at the New Yorker, um, it's not enough to say this is coming from an anonymous source. You, um, there are very good reasons to protect to protect the identity of a source, but you have to give the the contact of. Um, you know, if possible, you want to give the contact um, uh, of that source to the fact checker so that um, uh, the fact checker can get in touch and can um, verify the details um, of, um, of what's being quoted. And that's just to protect against, you know, um, a journalist impulse to say, well, I guess it's anonymous. So, you know, I can, you know, like whatever I say goes, you know, someone there is, um, it's really to, 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 to make sure that, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you have absolutely uh, no room to, to, to do that. But then there are circumstances in which even, you know, a source is not comfortable um, having, you know, the fact checker, uh, uh, you know, get in touch. And oftentimes, um, you know, conversations are, are you know, recorded, um, you know, notes are taken. Um, we do want to make sure that um, uh, the source feels as protected as possible, and um, that they are not at all, you know, harmed in the process of um, a conversation with the reporter. But that the reporter is also held to the highest level of accountability, um, so that uh, you know she, you know, so that so that she doesn't feel like anonymous is a cover for um, for you know whatever works. So that someone else is checking on her work, checking on my work, and making sure that um, you know everything, uh, and also giving kind of a dig dignity to um, to the anonymous source. You know, like even though she she's not named, you know, she, she we owe it to her to make sure that everything that she has said has been conveyed accurately and um, within context. That's interesting about the dignity of the source as well. Um, well, moving on from writing to politics, let's talk about Hong Kong. We're sitting here in Hong Kong, Anthony and I. Um, you were covering the protests for the New Yorker in September of 2019, uh, mm -hmm. alongside probably alongside people listening to the Zoom event, and, and certainly Anthony, who was out there with you. Um, right. First, first, tell us what it was like to come to Hong Kong and report on this as someone born in China yet who spent most of her life in the US, um, you say in one piece that there comes a moment in every foreign correspondent's life when she must confront whether the story that she is telling is hers to tell. I thought mm -hmm. that was a pretty powerful statement. Uh, did you end up feeling this was your story to tell? And what were your overall impressions at the time uh, covering the protests and, and what has stuck in your mind uh, from, uh, from a year ago? Right. I mean, it was such an exhilarating time, um, but also a painful time um, for, um, uh, as you see, you know, um, the city, you know, convulsed um, uh, by, 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 by conflicts of such an epic scale. And I, and that's, I think, um, a moment when I really had to ask myself how to tell the story. And um, that was, that that um, was worthy um, of um, of an event of this uh, scale and of um, just the, the the myriad voices um, that makes um, that made the protests. I think um, you know so um, uh, so 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 difficult I think for many outsiders to fully um, understand and you know usually um, as a geopolitical reporter you are <laughs> instructed not to you know mug the camera you know you're really there to just present what's happening but I started feeling when I was you know when I when I write about China and especially when I write about Hong Kong that there is 
you know, there's something disingenuous about me, um, about the veneer of objectivity that um, I might bring to a story if I don't tell the readers anything about myself about and about where I'm coming from. Because that assumes that somehow the narrative I give is um, truth with a capital T. And we all know that it clearly is filtered through my, um, through my um, uh, re reporting lenses, and I wanted my readers to know what my, you know, what what those lenses are, so that they can judge for themselves whether um, they can trust me. I mean, th that was to me the. I, I keep asking myself if I was reading this, how do I, you know, how do I trust what's on the page, and how do I trust, you know, the voice um, that's communicating what's on the page, and. And that's why, you know, in all my pieces about Hong Kong, um, I try to um, briefly um, let my readers know a little bit about my background as um, ethnic Chinese, born in the mainland, um, educated um, in the U.S., and my, you know, relationship with Hong Kong, um, which is, you know, through really through um, a best friend um, from uh, from high school who is, you know, um, a Hong Kong native and uh, visiting, you know, Hong Kong um, from uh, my teenage years. Um, but uh, you know, the more people I talked to in um, Hong Kong, the more I felt that it was my responsibility to both address the complexity of voices um, animating, you know, the chaos on the streets, but also to offer this, you know, some suggestion that moral clarity is possible at the end of, um, uh, 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 you know, at the end, you know, from the sidelines looking at these um, events. And I find that was a delicate balance um, because uh, oftentimes, you know, um, oftentimes when you uh, give voice to kind of twelve different uh, perspectives, um, the readers left thinking, well, you know, like, okay, so you've um, you've given me. <laughs> You've um, uh, uh, you've you've given me sort of a write up of all, all your interviews. What am I supposed to think of this? But on the other hand, um, you don't want to be heavy handed, especially in a subject as sensitive as Hong Kong. About well, this is the takeaway. Here is the moral he hero, and here is the villain. Because you know, no story is reducible to 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 that kind of simplification. And um, and in all my 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 stories, um, you know, I did a profile of Denise Ho, and um, and then you know, I, my story on the Hong Kong protests, and I've done a few reflections on that um, uh, experience. I, um, I I find myself um, really trying to both give as comprehensive, um, uh, you know, sweep as possible of what's happening on the ground, but also critiquing myself in the reporting process. I mean, that is the only way I can, that, that, that's the only way I can sort of justify why I even have this, you know, voice on the page so that the readers can feel they're in control of judging me rather than feeling like they have to accept my judgment of what's happening. And uh, in the June 23rd issue of the magazine, uh, as the national security law was about to take effect here, you write about what that could mean for Hong Kong, and you discuss the relative degrees of oppressed freedoms or, or absence of, uh, in some cases, in Hong Kong, China, and the U.S. Uh, a few months out from that now, what do you think about the risk to, in Hong Kong, and, and particularly the press freedom? Uh, how are you seeing this from your vantage point, having you know, been close up with this, but now, now back in the U.S., watching it from there would be an interesting perspective for for us to hear about. I mean, um, I'm going to be completely frank. I mean, I have um, I've watched with alarm and um, and with not a little bit of um, I think um, you know grim um, uh, hardened <laughs> um, hardened throat you know expectations. Um, uh, as as the security law came into effect, as um, you know, as um, Apple Daily, um, uh, you know, has been um, 
you know, ha you know, has been uh, at the center um, uh, of, you know, this this debate over press freedom. And I'm not, I mean, I, I hate to say this, um, but I, I, I haven't been terribly encouraged by the turn of events. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, um, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that uh, I'm not alone in feeling this way in talking to friends in Hong Kong. I mean, many of them, um, I think in private have said, well, you know, what is my plan B? You know, do I want, you know, can I stay in the city? Um, how do I stay true to myself? And how do I stay true to my opinions, um, especially if they're artists and writers, if I, you know, if they, if they feel like they are in jeopardy um, by staying in uh, the city. And, 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 I, and I'm sorry to say the pandemic hasn't helped matters. Um, it has mm -hmm. only um, distracted, I think, the world from um, China's encroachment. And it has also made it, I think, it, 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 um, the Trump presidency has also, um, you know, delegitimized de um, this, you know, liberal liberal values for um, for 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 so many people watching um, around the globe, and uh, I um, I I think when I was in Hong Kong, I was most moved by the. By, I mean, it's it, it's a strange. This is a strange thing to say, but by the spirits, by the spirit and the courage of um, the students, you know, on the ground, and the fact that they didn't think they needed a long term solution, where they didn't need the guarantee that things were definitely going to work out, to feel like they needed to do what they needed to do in um, the short term, um, which was to make their voices known. And I found, and I found that very um, inspiring and moving, maybe, probably, maybe because I am um, an immigrant from, you know, mainland China of the 80s and 90s when so much of my life and my parents' life has been about very pragmatic um, uh, um, compromises and trade-offs. Um, I often, I mean, and that's why I think, you know, these larger moral questions um, are at the center of many of my um, uh, stories because I'm, I feel myself deeply the sense of being someone who is compromised and whose, whose existence was made possible by some of the moral compromises that my mother that my mother uh, made as uh, a Chinese immigrant. And now, you know, looking at Hong Kong, looking at, you know, students, um, young people, even, you know, middle aged and, you know, older folks who are living in this different era and who are saying, um, there's some things that are non-negotiable and, uh, um, and, you know, that's things like, you know, freedom and, uh, and liberty and we will um, not be, you know, we will, we, we, we will not be talked out of um, uh, these pursuits. And I, and I, I, I find that incredibly, um, you know, inspiring, and even though I know that there is no really easy path forward. Thank you for that. Um, a, a question from Anthony. Um, given the US-China relationship and pressure on US journalists and, and other recent developments, would you personally feel safe traveling to and reporting from China at the moment if you were able um, to get back there You know, after uh, virus restrictions were lifted? <laughs> um, uh, Anthony, you're asking the question that I'm asking myself <laughs> day and night. <laughs> um, uh, gosh, I really wish I had an easy, I wish someone, you know, honestly, I wish someone could answer that question um, for me. I mean, I, uh, you know, I really, I miss um, going to China to report. I still have, uh, you know, um, relatives in China. I absolutely loved, you know, being in Hong Kong, um, you know, even during, um, you know, even, even during the turbulence of the protests. And it pains me to think um, that I am, 
you know, taking these, I would be taking these significant risks. Um, and, uh, but I, what I have to keep in mind is that I'm not just jeopardizing my own personal safety that, um, you know, I am attached to this magazine, it would, would compromise um, my colleagues, and it could compromise other journalists. Um, if, uh, if, if I, um, you know, did not have a, a smooth um, uh, trip in, in China. Um, so I probably, you know, in a short term for a variety of reasons, I wouldn't be traveling, but I, my, my very unsatisfying answer is that it's very much wait and see, um, uh, you know, uh, depending on, you know, the, the U.S. election, depending on, um, where, you know, Biden's team, um, tag, uh, you know, tax, um, if Biden wins the election. So there's just a tremendous amount of, um, uncertainty and, um, but I, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'll be, you know, booking my tickets um, just yet. <laughs> well, um, I would be remiss with just two weeks to go into the U.S. President election, not to ask about your thoughts, uh, given your background on Chinese um, U.S. issues, what this could mean for U.S.-China relations. Uh, if Joe Biden wins, is, is Xi Jinping secretly pleased, um, given all the nasty things um, Donald Trump has said about China? Or will this be more difficult, in your view, for uh, Xi's policies and the, the central government's policies? Right. I think that, um, you know, again, a great question. I think that um, Trump has been such a devastatingly unpredictable um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, factor um variable in all you know um in all in all this someone who does not you know someone like trump who doesn't seem in full control of his um of um of his impulses and of um of his faculties they do um you know lend greater credence to the chinese argument that look this is what happens in a democracy and um you know his epic failure to control the spread of um covid is just another um you know compelling um piece of evidence as to why democracy is a complete failure and um and i think that there must be something <laughs> Every time um, Trump makes uh, another, you know, uh, faux pas, which um, is, is just sort of like minute to minute at, at this point, I think Xi Jinping and um, and his team at Zhou Nanhai are just, uh, and they must be, I mean, just a little, at least a little bit gleeful that, you know, that, that without, <laughs> um, that they don't have to pay for the ample evidence of why, um, uh, you know, the West is, 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 is rapidly becoming such a failure and China is destined to rise um, and be the superpower that Xi Jinping has told all of us um, it, it, it um, it, it deserves to be. Um, I think with Biden, I mean, there's a trade-off. One can imagine that in Xi's head, he's thinking Biden will be someone who's more predictable. Um, you know, you will not like Xi's team will not be, you know, waking up to 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 completely, you know, um, uh, 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 deranged tweets and having to scramble to kind of um, uh, to to craft a response, but. Most of the time, um, Trump's insanity has worked to, I mean, has at times, I mean, um, worked to China's favor. So there's a gamble, like I think for Xi, you know, like Trump, you can't really plan ahead. And, you know, the Chinese are like, they, they you know, they're, they're very, in, in that sense, like they're the exact opposite of Trump. They like to be able to, you know, plan um, uh, um, uh, a response and be as kind of, you know, uh, uh, cool and level-headed as possible. And with Joe and um, with Biden, they'll be able to do that. But but one can see that Biden might not offer as much um, as a fodder and evidence for um, the eminent collapse of um, uh, Western democracy uh, as we as we as we know and see it, and that you know that 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 has its own challenges. So um, so 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 she must be, I think, making. I mean, and his own pro and con charts for both. But on the whole, I think he has been grateful for the Trump um, uh, presidency. Um, if nothing else, you know, for the way that it has you know, taken the US down a peg or 12, and that has, you know, worked tremendously to, um, to China's favor. 
Well, thank you. And what we end all our Zoom events, uh, which sadly we're going to need to do in a minute here, um, with this question, and it's particularly relevant for one for you as a writer. Uh, what are you reading this fall? Nonfiction, fiction, and what are the one, two, or three uh, books you would recommend? Right. Um, well, I um, uh, I <laughs> I read. Um, uh, I mean, I, I I read a lot outside of the um, China kind of geopolitical <laughs> um, uh, uh, sphere. Even though you know, I I'm also um, uh, I I I I I, I, um, I try to stay on top of that. You know, as well. I there's a new um, there's a a new book on the uh, cultural revolution um, out by uh, FSG. I think um, I'm blanking on the um, on the name. Um, I'm uh, I'm looking it up right now. Um, that I'm 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 obsessed with the cultural revolution um, uh, as this period of history that I have never lived through. But I think explains so much of the pain and also the psychosis um, uh, um, of modern China. And um, whenever there's a new, um, uh, there's, a, when th there's a new history, especially one that is, you know, deeply reported and, um, oh, it's by uh, 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 Yang, Yang, Jiesh, Yang Jisheng, um, who I think wrote a piece about, who, who wrote a book about, you know, the Great Famine before the, before the Cultural Revolution. Um, I'm very much looking forward to that. I've just been um, uh, given a galley, so I'm reading um, that right now. And I am also um, reading a completely um, kind of um, opposite end of the uh, bookshelf. I'm reading um, a memoir by, um, by Rachel Cusk. It's uh, called A Life's Work on uh, motherhood and her very ambivalent um, relationship to motherhood and what it means to bring a child into the world. And um, yes, you know, on the one hand, it seems very distant from um, geopolitics, but on the other hand, it is, um, I'm not, you know, I'm only um, like, you know, 70 pages in, it is about whether a mother is custodian of her child or whether um, she has ownership over her child and trying to puzzle through, you know, that relationship um, of, you know, of, of, of this body that once that, that used to be part of you, but no, but now um, must be um, allowed to grow um, on her own. And I think about that, you know, tying it back to China and the party's relationship with the people um, uh, historic, uh, historically, um, uh, you know, China, you know, Chinese, um, the political elites relationship with his people, whether it can, you know, grant its people, you know, the, 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 um, the right to kind of grow and thrive on their own, or whether they will always feel um, ownership of this country of um, 1.4 billion. So um, two very different books, but in some ways kind of are helping me um, make sense of some of the questions in my head. Well, great recommendations. And we, we include, we'll include them in our, in our book list for our, um, our members. Well, Jean Peng, thank you so much for your time here today. And we welcome you when you feel comfortable. Uh, to come back, uh, Hong Kong uh, to visit us in person and uh, to have another conversation in person uh, here at the FCC. So thank you so well, much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, I am, uh, I'm incredibly jealous that um, you can uh, walk out after, I mean, um, this talk and have the best fish congee in the world, which is the <laughs> Sadly unavailable here, but um, but yes, uh, I um, uh, you know I, I I also hope that I can return to Hong Kong, Hong Kong one day soon. Great, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.